No, biblical Christianity is unlike any other religion on earth. In fact, it's not wrong to say that biblical Christianity isn't a religion at all. Amen. We've learned that from the book of Romans. Religion, Romans has taught us, is about law keeping. Religion is about self-improvement. Religion is about what you must do to appease God. Religion is about what I must do to achieve salvation. But in Romans chapters 1 through 4, we've learned that biblical Christianity is not like that. In Romans, Paul reveals that biblical Christianity is not about what we do for God. It is about what God does for us. In biblical Christianity, law doesn't lead to righteousness. Law can only expose our sin. In biblical Christianity, our works don't save us. In fact, they can only condemn us. In biblical Christianity, we cannot achieve worthiness. We can only receive it as God's gift. In biblical Christianity, forgiveness and new life is the grace of God. A grace He offers rather than a wage He's obligated to pay. In biblical Christianity, it's faith that saves us and not works. I pray you understand that. And I pray that you have embraced or will embrace the truth of biblical Christianity. I pray that you will follow Jesus and will entrust yourself to Him. So what if you have trusted Christ and what He did for you? What if He is your Lord and Savior? What does that mean? What do you have when you've got Jesus? Paul, in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, begins to answer that question when he tells us what it means to be justified and tells us what are the benefits of being justified through faith in Jesus Christ. If you have your Bible, turn with me this morning to Romans chapter 5. And please follow as I read the first five verses this morning. Now again, Paul speaks to all those who trust in Jesus when he writes these words. Therefore, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, through Jesus. We have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So let's start with verse 1. In verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, are you certain that you have been justified by faith? And do you know what being justified by faith means? In Romans chapters 2, 3, and 4, Paul has used various forms of the word justify nine different times. And here again in chapter 5, he uses it. And so the word justify or justification is a critically important word in this book of Romans. And we need to be certain that we understand it. In Paul's day, the word justify was a legal term. The word literally means to declare someone not guilty in a court of law. Now let me ask, 
Do people who are actually guilty of a crime sometimes get declared not guilty in a law court? It happens. Sometimes guilty people are declared not guilty because of an illegal search or some other legal technicality. Sometimes guilty people are declared to be not guilty by a court of law because of insufficient evidence or because of an incompetent prosecutor or jury. Whatever the case might be, here's the question. Once a guilty person has been declared not guilty, can that court of law ever punish them for their crime? The answer is no. A justified criminal will not and in fact cannot ever be punished by his or her crime, at least not by that court of law, once they have been declared by the court not guilty. And that's exactly how it works with us when we get justified in God's courtroom through personal faith in Jesus Christ. In spite of our actual guilt and sin, in spite of our crimes against our holy God, God himself declares every believer in Jesus to be not guilty based on his faith or her faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross to pay our sin penalty and who rose from the grave to share his life and in fact his righteousness with us. Not guilty. Now let me ask, has that happened to you? Has the death of Jesus become your death in God's eyes? Has the payment that Jesus made for your sin, has it been applied to your account? Has the righteousness of Jesus Christ been credited as your righteousness by faith? If that's happened, then you have been justified. You have been legally declared not guilty by God himself based on what Jesus did when he died on the cross and rose from the grave. So now let's ask, what are the specific benefits of being justified in Christ? Listen again to verse 1 and hear what Paul says. Paul writes, Therefore, since we have been justified, declared not guilty by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, here's what you get when you've got Jesus. If you've been justified by faith in Christ, you get peace with God. Peace with God. Now I wonder if we really comprehend how great a gift that is. Before we can understand what peace with God means, we need to remember our condition before God offered us reconciliation to himself in Christ. If we'll remember as we work through the book of Romans, Romans 1 verse 18, Paul has already told us that the wrath of God, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. That means the wrath of God has been revealed against you and me. In Romans 1 verse 24, again in verse 26 and verse 28, Paul told us that apart from Jesus, God in His righteous anger, He turns us over to sin, our own sin, and self-destruction. In Romans 2 verse 5, Paul warned us that until we find Jesus Christ, Every day of our lives is another day of storing up wrath. The wrath of God against us. Romans 3 verses 10 through 12. The Apostle Paul confronted us with the reality of how hopelessly enslaved to sin we are. 
Paul told us that none, no one, not you, not me, none is righteous. No, not one, Paul says. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. And that's why Ephesians chapter 2 verse 3 declares that apart from Jesus, apart from faith, we are all by nature children of wrath. Children of wrath. And so the Bible is very clear. Without Jesus, you are an enemy of God. And so am I. Have you ever stopped to think about what it means to be God's enemy? We would be wiser if we chose our enemies more carefully. What does it mean to be a child of God's wrath? Do you understand what's your present and what your future would be if God had just left you to yourself. If God did not find a righteous way to declare you and me to be not guilty in His eyes. Do you know that without Jesus, without justification, you would simply be given over forever to your own sin? If you hadn't been justified by faith in Christ, you'd already be destined for an eternally miserable existence away from the love of God, away from the comfort of God, away from the presence of God. You'd be justly destined for unending hell. We all would be. And you see, that is what makes the promise of Romans 5.1 so transforming to anyone who will comprehend it. Paul says, since we've been justified, it's a fact. In Christ, we've been justified. Since we've been declared not guilty by faith, Paul says, we have peace with God. We have peace with God, does Paul say, through our own efforts? We have peace with God through our own obedience. We have peace with God through our own practice of religion, through our own good works. Is that what it says? No, Paul says, if we've been justified, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, if you have faith in Jesus then you have been declared not guilty in the eyes of God. And that means, in spite of your very real sin, God is no longer angry with you. God is no longer at war with you. Listen, all of you who know Jesus, but still find yourself afraid of God, let the truth flood your soul. In Christ, God is not angry with you anymore. In Christ, you need never fear His wrath again. In Christ, you don't need to be afraid of Satan. You don't need to be afraid to die. You don't need to be afraid of hell. Since you have been justified by faith, since I've been justified by faith, we have Peace with God. Peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God when we deserve nothing but His wrath. How magnificent. How wondrous. But you know what? It gets more wondrous still. Peace with an enemy can mean nothing more than an end to open conflict. You can have peace with an enemy who simply chooses to ignore you. But peace with God, it means so much more than that. 
Listen as we again read Romans 5.1 along with the first half of verse 2 now. Paul writes, Therefore, since we have been justified, since we've been declared not guilty by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and through Him, through Christ. We have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. You understand what Paul tells us here? The peace with God that we find in Jesus Christ involves more than God simply withholding His wrath. Beyond our escape from judgment, this peace with God we find in Christ is a peace that provides access to and intimacy with the God who made us. The Greek word translated access in verse 2. It's a word that has to do with being able to enter into the presence of a king or a monarch. Now, if I fly to Washington, D.C. tomorrow, drive over to the White House, and honestly expect that I'm going to have lunch with the president, I'm going to be disappointed. I'm going to be disappointed because I will discover very quickly that I do not have access to the President of the United States. But see what Paul says here? Once we've been justified by faith, Paul says we have something infinitely greater than access to a world leader like the President. We have access through Christ to the God of all creation by the grace in which we stand. And Paul defines that grace for us even more in Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 6. Ephesians 2, 4 through 6, Paul writes, But God, God being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. He opens the doors of heaven by grace when we are justified in Christ. Do you understand what you get when you got Jesus? If you've been justified, if you have been declared not guilty through faith in Jesus, you have peace with God. If you've been justified by faith, you have even more than that. You have access to an intimate relationship with God by means of the grace in which you stand. That's the same grace by which you were saved. By grace, think about this. By grace, the God who was once your enemy has now become your father. And by grace, you have become his child. You become his child. So how do we respond? At least how would we respond if we fully grasp everything it means to be justified by faith in Jesus Listen again to Romans 5, verse 2. Paul says, Through Him, through our Lord Jesus Christ, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. See, when we come to understand the justification that we have in Jesus, our only response can be rejoicing. More specifically, Paul says, when we understand how we've been justified, how we've been declared not guilty, how we have peace with God, how we have access to God, when we understand that, we will respond by rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. 
But what does Paul mean when he talks about rejoicing in our hope of the glory of God? In the book of Romans, I think this hope of the glory of God we rejoice over, it has to do with our own transformation on the day of Christ's coming. Our own transformation on the day of Christ's coming. You see, in Genesis chapter 1, we are told that we are created in the image of God. In other words, we were created to reflect God's character. We were created to share in God's glory. But apart from Christ, we don't reflect God's character, do we? And we don't share in God's glory. Because of our rebellion and our sin, none of us, not one of us, even comes close to what we were created to be. And that's why when Paul speaks of humanity in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, he declares, all have sinned and what? Fall short of the glory of God. Fall short of the glory He intended to ha- us to have when He made us in His image. But now that we've been justified, Paul says we can rejoice because we know that a day is coming. A day is coming when the glory of God will again be found in us and reflected by us. It's the day Paul speaks of in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, 16 through 19, when he writes, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we... We who have been justified, we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may what? In order that we may also be glorified. Glorified with Him. For I consider, Paul says, the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of who? The sons, the daughters of God. That is, creation waits for the revealing of us who will at that point have become everything God intended us to be when He created us. Let me say it this way. We know that when Jesus comes again, He is coming to reveal the fullness of God's glory. But do we know that the fullness of God's glory encompasses, it includes the glory of with which we ourselves will be glorified by Him on the final day. And Paul says, that's the glory that we rejoice in as those who have been justified. Because we've been justified by faith in Christ, we have peace with God. Because we've been forever declared not guilty by God, We have access to God by grace. And to these truths, Paul says, our only response can be rejoicing. Because we have been justified through faith, we rejoice in our hope of God's own glory, the glory to be revealed in us on the day of Christ's return. But he goes on. Paul says if we're truly justified, our cause for rejoicing isn't simply rooted in our future hope. Our cause for rejoicing is also rooted in our present circumstances, even when our present circumstances include suffering. Listen again to what Paul says as he continues, verses 3 through 5. Paul says, more than that, More than rejoicing in our hope of God's glory, we rejoice in our sufferings. 
knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. True believers in Jesus Christ who have been justified by faith, they rejoice even in suffering. So what does it mean to rejoice in the midst of suffering? Does he just laugh a lot? It helps to know that the Greek word for rejoice in this passage can be and often is simply translated as boast. And in this context, boasting has to do with the confidence that we have in the promises of God. And that would mean that rejoicing, the rejoicing Paul speaks of here, it goes deeper than just feeling good or being happy or pasting a fake smile on your face. Romans 5, rejoicing is our expression of confidence in the Word of God, the promises of God. Rejoicing is our certainty of the eternal hope that we have in Jesus Christ. It's a joy, this rejoicing that cannot be swallowed up by short-term pain. It's a joy, it's a rejoicing that takes the long view. It's a joy that focuses on our eternal destiny in Jesus. And that's why Paul says that as believers, we rejoice even in our sufferings. We rejoice in our sufferings, not because suffering becomes pleasant. Rather, based on God's word, we rejoice in suffering because we understand the fruit that suffering will bear in our lives for eternity. Paul says we rejoice in our sufferings knowing what? Knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Do you believe that God actually has a purpose for whatever suffering He allows in your life? That's really a key question for all of us. Do you believe that God actually has a purpose for whatever suffering He allows in your life? And do we know that the quick fix we usually pray for may not be God's plan and probably isn't? When pain comes, we really do wish, I wish, it would just magically disappear. But Paul reminds us that God wants to use our pain to produce within us suffering I'm sorry, to produce within us endurance. That makes quite a bit of difference. (laughs) Endurance, endurance. More than that, Paul reminds us that suffering over the course of time, that develops godly character. And all of us know that that's true, don't we? Seldom, if ever, does easy living drive us closer to God Seldom, if ever, does easy living help us overcome sin or purge us of our wrong attitudes and behaviors. See, isn't it true? Don't we know that usually it's tribulation that God uses to mature us in Jesus Christ? And that's why we rejoice in our suffering. Even in the midst of suffering, we confidently rejoice in God because we believe that His promise 
Again, a promise found in the same book of Romans that all things work together for the good of those who believe in Him, who love Him, and who are called according to His purpose. All things work together for the good of those who love Him. But not only do we rejoice in suffering because suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character. Paul goes on to say that along with character, suffering produces hope. Produces hope. So how does that happen? How does pain and suffering bring hope to our lives? Well, first we need to understand that the hope Paul speaks of here is the hope that never disappoints, is the hope that will never put us to shame. And that means it's the hope that is rooted in God's love. It is a hope that every believer experiences deeply and personally through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Don't you see how God uses suffering to break us of our habit of trying to find hope in the things of this world. So for instance, God might use financial loss to break us of putting our hope in money. God might use illness to break us of hoping in health and physical strength. God might use broken relationships to break us of putting our hope in other human beings. God uses suffering to teach us that the only hope that never disappoints is hope in God. The only hope that never disappoints is the hope we find in God. So what do you get when you got Jesus? What do you have when you have been justified by faith. Believer in Jesus Christ, you who have been declared not guilty based on what He has done, what you have is peace with God when you deserve wrath. What you have is access to God. The one who was once your enemy is now your father. And you're his child. And if you know that, if you're convinced of that, you will rejoice. You can't help it. You will rejoice in the hope of God's glory, which is a glory in which you and I in Christ will share. And more than that, you will even rejoice in suffering because you know that suffering brings endurance and endurance brings character and character brings hope in God who pours out His love into our hearts by His Spirit. And that's a hope that will never shame you. That's a hope that will never let you down. It's a hope that will never, ever disappoint.